What a day of basketball. We welcome into you to this special report from the University of Dayton Arena. We are high above the court here as we bring you highlights from Division IV and Division III action today at the University of Dayton. I'm Patrick Campbell. Glad to be along with you. Joined alongside Aaron Matthews and Mark Shine and a lot of terrific basketball to tell you about. We've got highlights and we've got reaction. And we've got all kinds of stuff and we saw a, a lot of very good basketball to get, to yeah, get Aaron. Yeah, we really did, Patrick. I mean, two great games in Division Four. Botkins played well. They had to battle back just like Columbus Grove did. Grove was down 10 points in their game in the third quarter, but Grove found a way to win. And I think a lot of it had to do when Kyle Sexton fell, fouled out uh, for New Boston Glenwood Marshine. Well, they did, but I think one of the, there's a lot of keys in that game if we want to get to that particular point. But I think a really interesting thing was both teams had not very good third quarters, and both teams had really good fourth quarters to win, Botkins and Columbus Grove. We will get you the highlights. We're going to start with Botkins in that Division Four semifinal taking on Richmond Heights, and this game was competitive all the way through. Botkins and Richmond Heights, these highlights brought to you by Bankley Realty. Botkins taking the court, and they were fired up, ready to go in this one, and this was a competitive game throughout, and it would be Botkins getting on the scoreboard first. Jaden Pretty hits the floating jump shot to put the Trojans up first, and then Pretty hitting the tough turnaround fadeaway to go up four to two. Pretty starting off hot. Most of the offense, really all the offense for the Trojans early on in this one. He finishes the floater to go up six to two, and this was all Jaden Pretty early, it was, early on. Well, what they found out was the blue team couldn't guard him. He was able to get into the lane. He was able to get all the way to the rim and the pull-up jumper like that one right there. Spartans did have no answers early on, and then more guys getting into it. Carter Plyman with a nice cut to the basket, as that would give Botkins a five-point lead. And then, hey, guess what? How about more pretty action? Pull up, jumper, knocks it down. Botkins continuing to have the lead. Lead they would not relinquish until later on in this one. That shot blocked, but Zane Paul, Johnny on the spot, getting the and one. And that would give the lead back to Botkins at this point, 17-16. Then we'll see Jacob Plyman, big man, throwing it down with two hands. Excellent pass on the side. He went slip screen, went to the goal, and got an excellent pass and finished with a two hand. Then Paul throwing it. Another Plyman getting into action. This time it's Carter Plyman, and he scores. Botkins up. As I said, they led consistently, but the lead never got too far. In fact, for the most part of the game, they only have about a five point lead, which they have right here. Pretty getting to the rim, and he did that at will as he scores, as makes it a five point game. And then this is this is not the same play. This is completely different, but Pretty doing every, what he did pretty much all afternoon. He was able to take the ball, finish the goal with his right hand. The, the contact came after the ball was through the rim. Second half action now is Zane Paul gets the three-pointer, and that would be it for a long time for Buckets. Ten consecutive point possessions without a score. This basket was the only score out of 16 possessions. So it's Jaden Pretty who stops the drought. That would bring them within two. Richmond Heights really didn't take a lot of advantage of that drought, but when they got back into it, Jamison Meyer hitting this big shot here to go up by one, and then he had another three. This really kind of changed the, the, the face of the entire fourth quarter. Now that's what he gets paid to do, you know, nail those three balls. He pitched the first one, gets that one coming off a, a set play out of a timeout, baseline score. Hits another big three there. That would give them the lead back as we went back and forth here toward the end. Uh, the Heights will tie it again, but Pretty, the guy who got it done all afternoon, hits another shot to take the lead, and that would be a lead that Botkins would not give up. Botkins with the 44-40 victory as they advance to the first state semifinal, state final rather, in school history. Afterward, we heard from some of the players and head coach, Sean Powell. The community came out, supported very, very well. Um, when we, as soon as the announcements went off for the starters everybody jumped up and roared and that, I think that energy went through all our kids and they they performed on the floor going into this game uh, finally being an underdog so to say um, I think it, it made our kids more relaxed to go out there and play Jamison came off the bench had those two huge threes for you late in the ball game this kid never met a shot he didn't like. He shoots the ball so confidently and so well. Yeah. I mean, it seemed like, you know, after that 10 minute drought, that three is what took the load off everybody. Your guys really just relaxed the final four minutes plus. Yep. I said it a while ago. Jamison's that kid that when he gets ready to shoot the basketball, everyone in the gym that's supporting Bakken's jumps up because uh, we believe he's going to make it. And uh, whenever you have a kid like that on your team, you always give him the green light. Um, his, it's not just three points when it goes in. It's, it's a momentum change when, when he shoots. Just uh, 
talk about this opportunity from a dad perspective, having your sons uh, on the floor as your general, running the show for you, and just how, how special is that that you guys are going to have one more dance on Sunday? Yeah, uh, and that, that was the first thing I said to the team. Um, uh, I thank them to, to allow the seniors to have one more game. Uh, I'm not ready to let them go. Uh, but as far as my son, um, it's not something we really think about just yet. It, it was different driving to the game with him um, or to the gym with him today. It, it was a little different in the car. Um, but it's something that in 10 years we'll be able to sit back and probably pop some tape in and, and watch, watch him play. Um, but as of right now, it's really player coach when it comes to him and I in basketball. Um, I mean, I think right after the national anthem, we get ready to call our names, and our whole crowd stood, or they were about to announce our names, and the whole crowd stood up and cheered. I say it just gave me goosebumps. I mean, we had the whole town behind us. Anything else? What, what was your message to your guys in that fourth quarter, especially after you had the lead at halftime, they came back to take the lead in the third quarter? In such a close game, what did you tell your guys to make sure they stayed level headed so they could go in this game? Me. Um, we talked earlier in the week. We talked about runs. We talked about ways of stopping runs. Uh, you can stop a run by going down and scoring. You can stop a run by just going down and executing and, and taking time off the clock. Or you can just sit down and defend. Or from the coaches, we can call a timeout. So we were prepared for their run. Uh, we had four or five different ways where we, we, we were planning on stopping it. Uh, in the first half, we stopped it by scoring and getting an early layup. Uh, there in the third quarter. Uh, we stopped it defensively, um, contesting shots, getting rebounds. Um, so we, we were ready. We were ready for a run, a team uh, as athletic as they are, and, and put up 75, 80 points uh, in, in, in a matter of minutes. Um, we were ready for that. So Botkin, that's Botkin's picking up the four-point win, your interview with the coach. And you know, one of the things he talked about was, you know, we get into the X's and O's of all, of all that goes into the basketball, but he really talked about the relationship and how – this time with his son also important that there's all that stuff but there's a little player and coach but is also you know it, it's a little bit more special being here with him yeah he talked coach Powell talked about it as you heard there in the interview and the opportunity of them ride to school together on Friday morning uh, getting ready to make the trip down and for Botkins it's not that long of a trip down I-75 here to UD Arena but you know you just look at that whole ball club these kids are a very close unit um, I've known the Meyer family for many years ironically through the state tournament when it was in Columbus you know they were sitting in the front row behind media row and get the chance to know Jameson and his family and that young man has been has snuck on many floors to shoot in these big gyms. He looked right at home today, <laughs> knocking down those two back-to-back -back threes, which really propelled Bobkins to the victory in the fourth quarter. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that was a really key. And the, the second one, he looks over to Coach because it's a dead ball timeout, and, and he looks over to Coach because he's getting the ball out of bounds, and he pointed up. Coach went, yep, stepped back behind a double screen, nailed the three ball. So that was a huge play at that point in time. You know, Botkins had that big 10-minute stretch where they didn't score anything, but they were able to defensively keep the clamps on the Spartans, didn't really let them get out to uh, any kind of a lead, really kept them close, and then they came up with those big shots when it counted, and that propelled them to a victory, helped propel them to the victory today. Yeah, it did. I mean, that 10-minute drought, most teams that's going to do. I mean, when you're at the state championship, unless you're just wired completely different, you're going to find a way to grind and resolve, and they did that here today. You know, I think, Aaron, uh, Coach Powell made some comments this week in the media about how he wanted, had to adjust. He came into the Shelby County League with, you know what, I'm going to be able to run up and down the floor, and I'm going to be able to score against these people. But he also found out to win in the Shelby County League, you got to defend and you got to execute in the fourth quarter, and he's taught his team to do that, and it showed today. Most, out, most definitely. So Botkins gets to advance to state, and they will face, well, I'm sure you know by now, Columbus Grove, who picked up the win. We've got the highlights of this one as well, taking on Glenwood, and this one also a very competitive matchup all the way throughout. Grove and Glenwood locking up, and these highlights brought to you by Hawker Drywall. Columbus Grove taking the court, ready to go, and, you know, first of all, good community support from Columbus Grove. Well, absolutely. I think both the schools that we covered in our area, they had great support, and you can see Grove off to a great start here. Trey Sauter hitting the tough shot to get things started, and then Sauter getting it to Ethan Hawker. Hawker with the close but not so easy bucket getting Columbus Grove started here, and then some more good passing. Blake Reynolds getting it down low and makes it a 6-3 to three lead for Columbus Grove. Opening half, Columbus Grove had nine assists, only three turnovers. Kate Bernesser with a three ball of his own, answering the three ball that Glenwood hit earlier. And then Bernesser again, same spot, 
Second verse, same as the first. He knocks that one down. And then Columbus Grove doing a great job early on forcing turnovers. We'll see here, they're able to force the turnover. And then good transition, Jackson Schrader lays it in, making it a 16 to eight game. It kind of looks like Grove is gonna pull away in this one. And then Gabe Clement hitting the three, making it 25 to 21. As we transition to the second half, Reynolds getting the offensive board and gets the putback. Blake Reynolds just had an awesome basketball game today, and we get to the fourth quarter action, it's going to be even more dominant. So time winding down in the third, Glenwood scores up by 10 points at this point, and then a heave at half court knocks it down. That cuts the lead to seven, and that was a big shot because it seemed the momentum changed at that time. It really did. That propels Grove into quarter number four, and they take over and takeover they did this time. It's Reynolds getting to the hoop, scoring, gets the and one. And then more action from Blake Reynolds this time. Spins around, avoids his defender, and knocks down the three, making it a five-point deficit, 48-43. Blake Reynolds always plays under control. There's another good pass. This is Bernesser with the huge three. That brought them to within two. And then Glenwood getting a bucket. And then Bernesser, same spot again. Got it. Tate, Tate had one. been kind of quiet for a long time. They, they find him for the two big threes right there. And now a play down low. This is Reynolds getting it up and in, and that would give Columbus Grove the lead, their first lead since early in the game. And then Columbus Grove, they get it back. Home run pass. Clement puts the exclamation point on this one. They come from behind victory for Columbus Grove. They get the job done, 58-53, a good, solid, all-round effort tonight. It really was, and they had a great fourth quarter to come back from a big deficit. It just shows the competitive spirit from Columbus Grove. Columbus Grove moves on to their state championship game. Afterward, we heard from Victoria's head coach, Chris Sauter, and some of the Bulldogs. I thought we did a nice job first quarter. Uh, scored 18 points in that first quarter, and then went for about the next two and a half quarters. It seemed like we kind of forgot to score, but or forgot how to score. but. A lot of credit goes to them. They mix things up defensively and they make it tough and uh, they challenge shots at the rim and uh, you got to give them a ton of credit because when they got up to 10 points, I think uh, a lot of those were just winning 50-50 balls and getting offensive rebounds and we weren't, for a stretch, we weren't very good defensively, but you know, give our kids credit. They battled, hung in there, made the plays down the stretch like you expect, you know, three seniors or four seniors to do. Two of them have played close to 100 games of varsity basketball. So uh, you want your guys to make plays down the stretch. And I thought Blake, Tate, and Gabe did a nice job of doing that for us. Questions? What did you kind of do offensively to kind of get uh, Tate open for a couple of big threes there in that fourth quarter? Or is it just how it worked out? Uh, we ran a couple sets for him to, to get him open. But I thought for a while we were pretty stagnant, just kind of standing. and. Uh, we weren't moving and cutting through the zone, so um, a lot of that goes on us. We weren't being very effective, but we were able to run a couple sets for him, uh, uh, get, a, get him running off a couple screens, and um, give him credit. He knocked down some huge threes in the fourth quarter. Coach, obviously it was a big moment in the game when the section fouled out. How did, how did your overall approach change? When uh, he's, a, he's a heck of a basketball player, and... Um, with his size and his ability to pass the ball, it really made it hard to trap them um, and really be aggressive defensively. And when he went out, we felt like we could extend the floor defensively, uh, pick him up full court, and then really trap on the half court. Uh, we didn't do a very good job of knocking down cutters at the beginning. I know Jones got loose a couple times, and they got a couple offensive rebounds. But I thought once we settled in, um, I thought, we got a little momentum, and when you get that momentum, you, you seem to play a little harder on that defensive end of the floor. And um, I think the momentum and uh, kind of carried us through down the stretch. Oh, they were guarding me pretty well. I don't think I was aggress as aggressive as I probably could have been, but I know I just kind of waited and finally got open there at the end, and Blake found me and just knocked it down. Coach, how, how great is it to have somebody like Tate just sitting there waiting? I mean. I nickname Cool Hand Tate because when you need him, he's there. I just well, you guys saw him hit the three at the end of the regional final game against New Bremen with 11 seconds left to give us the win. So, um, 
And when you get Blake the ball around the basket, he does you know, such a great job of passing the ball out of the post. So we just need guys to continue to move. And um, if he doesn't go score, he typically finds somebody in the right spot where they can uh, score. So he did a nice job of hitting Tate um, last week against New Bremen and again tonight. And you know, Tate does what Tate does, steps up and hits big shots. I said you know, all year I've been asked that question. And um, I think for about 20, three, 24 games, I said, you know, this is about this group of kids. It's unfortunate how that ended. Um, but, you know, we're playing for the kids that are on the team right now. And then once we got to regionals and had a chance to play New Bremen, uh, it kind of hit me that we have been playing for those four kids all year. And to see them in the crowd and be able to, you know, give those kids a hug after that regional championship game, um, we're definitely playing for Alex, Hop, Tanner, and Owen for sure because, uh, what they helped us accomplish last year is a big part of why we are where we are today because uh, their work ethic and how hard they played and uh, their leadership last year as seniors definitely, you know, it carried over to these guys, it carried over to the other guys that have stepped in to take their place this year. And um, so, yeah, they're definitely with us every time we step on the court. Yeah, you talked about how you kept talking to your guys, uh, even when you got down and played preference. Um, it's an unreal feeling, but I think playing football and being to regionals three times, we have it, the experience, so it's just a matter of going out there and executing the game plan. Columbus Grove picking up the nice win. You know, they had a 14 to 2 stretch that went against them during that game. They weren't able to score, and you heard Coach talk about it in that in the press conference. That three-pointer from half court, you just think, oh, well, that's that's something nice for the score column, but I think that really ignited the Bulldogs heading into the fourth quarter. And hopefully he got a Gatorade for that, too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> without a doubt. Uh, Mark Stein, you know, what they were able to do with that 14-2 run, Columbus Grove had a couple of nice 7-0 runs mixed throughout the game, particularly in the fourth quarter when they needed it. Well, the game was won in the fourth quarter and all of a sudden in the first quarter. If you add those two quarters together, Columbus Grove had 39 points in 22 possessions. That's a 1.77 every time you get possession of the basketball, and that's an unheard of number. Obviously, a lot of that came from the 13 points from the, from the point guard, uh, you know, um, maybe. Um, Reynolds. Reynolds, thank yeah. you very much. And the two threes by Burnesser in there were just huge as well. But uh, that, that was really key. And, and you mentioned, Aaron, they only scored five points to Glenwood after Sexton fouled out. That was attributed to the defense, but I also think they lost their score, and it kind of took them away from things they wanted to do. Back to Blake Reynolds for a minute. He's been, he's been that cool hand Luke for, the, for this Grove Bulldog team all throughout the tournament. You go back to when they played Lincoln View, when they played Ottawa in the district. I mean, in the fourth quarter, he put this, his team on its back. He did the same thing with, against Antwerp in overtime. He didn't have to do it as much against New Bremen. Uh, he got, you know, Tate Burnesser to step up and draw the three that won it with 10 seconds left. But I'll tell you what, the young man from being 5'10 to 6'4 as a, from a freshman to a senior year, you know, my good buddy Babe Kwasniak uses this all the time on Twitter. Winners win. Blake Reynolds is a winner, and he wins. And that's why he's the best milker on the farm. Yeah. He is. He is the best milker on the farm right now. Well, plenty of points scored between these three guys, and you saw Columbus Grove. We've seen him be healthy as they've gotten into the end of the season, but you saw Reynolds, Bernesser, Clement, all with good points, all with good minutes. In fact, Reynolds and Bernesha played all 32 minutes of the contest. It's like, this is what Columbus Grove is capable of. They're firing on all cylinders. And what a great time to be doing it at the state championship. Yeah, and they've shortened their bench. They're only going seven deep. They were going nine deep earlier in the year. They don't have to do that right now because they are pretty healthy by and large. I mean, they're still banged up. It's the grind of football in the deep run they had in football, the grind of basketball in this deep run that they've had. You're going to have your bumps and bruises and knickknacks and patty wax and all that other stuff, and somebody's dog's going to get a bone. <laughs> but, hey, Columbus Grove gets to go home. They get to relax in their own beds. They get to do things on their time to get ready for Sunday. Well, you know, I think part of that is, too, Patrick, is that – Trey Souter and, and Bo Burnesser got really important minutes when the other guys were hurt, and it showed today because they both had significant contributions. All right, well, we'll give a dog a break. We're going to step away and take a timeout. I still don't know what to do with the milkers thing that you mentioned. I've just been racking my brain this whole time. <laughs> when we come back, Division Three highlights on the way. Ottawa Glandorf, can they punch their ticket to playing on Sunday? Find out after this. Welcome back to the State Wrap-Up Show. We've switched locations now, moving to the media room inside the University of Dayton Arena as we talk about Ottawa Glandorf, their matchup, Division Three semifinal against Lutheran East. OG Highlights brought to you by Structure Outdoor and the nightcap tonight, Ottawa Glandorf taking on Lutheran East. 
OG ready to go and the Titans, we know we saw a lot of competitive matchups and this one, no different. Titans doing very well. Owen Nichols taking himself laid in. Nichols had a big night. Big night. Uh, offensively took the ball to the basket well. Mason made a three one point, got him back in the game. There's Schimler with the tough floater. He makes it four to two. And a little bit more action from Schimler. He gets it on a nice cut here. You saw him early and often getting to the basket. Nice uh, offense there by OG. Went back door against pressure. Then Nichols getting the ball down low. Putting the moves on. Nice shake around there, getting the rim friendly here in University of Dayton, and that makes it 10-7. to 7. Then Brennan Blevins getting in on the action. He would knock down a three, top of the key, and Blennon's had a number of those early on. Well, he did, and he had 13 points all in the second quarter. Really shot OG into the game as we see here. Blevins again with the three ball. That makes it 19-14, to 14, and we're going to fast forward to the third quarter. Nichols getting the inbounds and the score, taking the lead back game, going back and forth at this point in time, but there were plenty of droughts in this game as well. Was OG uh, went to, game got to a one point game. Lutheran East had five possessions in the third quarter. They scored 13 points, put themselves ahead. Colin, Colin White had the hoop and the harm there. Then it's Nichols with the offensive board. OG down five, and the Titans just not able to close that gap much more than two or three points. They're going to get a really nice shot here late uh, to tie the game or get back in the game. There's Nichols three right there. That would cut the lead to four. Nice shot. Again, Nichols having, you know, a, a pretty solid game. And then Blevins, nice circus shot. This got the crowd back into it uh, very late in the contest, but just too much. Lutheran East picks up the win tonight, 58-52. to They will advance. Afterward, we heard from Coach Tyson McLaughlin and some of his Titans. Obviously, I, I'm very proud, very proud of our guys. I, I thought our guys executed to a T tonight. We did everything. They did everything that I asked them to. Um, within our game plan, uh, we took a couple gambles, and you got to give, you got to give Luther Nice a lot of credit. A couple of the gambles that we gave with a couple guys, giving them a little bit more space, they capitalized, and, and that's a sign of a really good team. Um, you know, it was a, it was a tall task, no pun intended. I mean, they, they got all kinds of size and athleticism, um, and, and we were mat outmatched in, in some areas. And uh, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not ashamed to say that uh, because I, I mean it in a. And a, with the utmost respect for both programs, um, they found ways to, to, to get the job done. But I couldn't be prouder of, of the men in my locker room uh, because they did things the way they were taught, the way that we've talked all year. And uh, like I said, they have to beat us. We're not going to beat ourselves. And, uh, you know, I think, like I said, sometimes you just got to tip your cap to the other team. I think their defensive pressure pushed us so far away from the basket. Uh, we couldn't get into the flow that we wanted to. I thought we executed extremely well, especially in that first quarter. Uh, we were able to get to our spots um, as the game went on, not just their, their, um, their defensive pressure, but I think the physicality of their guys um, kind of wore on us as the game went on. Lutheran East just put together a terrific effort. Ava Glandorf didn't do a lot of wrong things. It's just Lutheran East was able to capitalize when they needed to. Yeah, I mean, Lutheran East got out rebounded by 11 by Ottawa Glandorf. I think just the size, the length, and the speed that, that Lutheran East brought, I don't, you know, the team that maybe OG saw like that this year would have been Shawnee in our area, uh, you know, back in January. But, you know, hats off to the Titans. A heck of a run, a great opportunity for them to get back to the Final Four. And Mark Schein, I mean, they, did, they left it all out there. They just fell short. Today. Absolutely. They got it to 49-50 with that wonderful shot and three-point play by Blevins. But from there on out, 10 points, 8 for 8 from the free throw line for Lutheran East, and OG couldn't catch them. Yeah, Tyson McLaughlin alluded to this in the press conference. He said that there were times where the, the droughts really hurt offensively, and credit to the OG defense, they were able to keep Lutheran East from really uh, slamming the door shut maybe a lot sooner than they could have in that fourth quarter. Yeah, when it's 50 points and there's still a minute 37 to go, you know you're in the basketball game and you're playing very, very well. It was 50-49 at that point, and they did stretch it out after that. So a terrific season for Ottawa Glandorf comes to an end tonight as Lutheran East advances. They will play Worthington Christian, who won on a last-second shot for the Division Three championship coming up on Sunday. Well, we still have plenty of coverage coming up tomorrow. We hope you'll join us at the same time, 10 p.m. on WOSN. We'll have coverage of the Shawnee Indians as they take on Akron, St. Vincent, St. Mary's. And then Sunday, we'll have the Division Championships, Division Four. Maybe even Division Two. We'll see how the Shawnee wraps it up. Well, that is going to wrap up our coverage right here from University of Dayton and a lot of people involved in making sure this broadcast gets
gets on, I want to thank Ryan Shadowald. I also want to thank Nick Fraley and Haley Thomas back at the station. I want to thank Ben Reif here and Zach Keith. Also, thank you, gentlemen, Aaron Matthews, Mark Shine, for being a part of it as well. Day one of three. Let's get it on tomorrow. <laughs> More action, more fun coming up tomorrow. That's going to wrap it up from here. I'm Patrick Hamler. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow. Have a good night.